You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Oh, hold up. Smell test. Go ahead. Sniff those pits. Now, your bits. Feet, toes, come on. Could be fresher, right? It's all good. Old Spice Total Body Deodorant Spray is gentle enough to use all over your body, giving you 24-7 lasting freshness with daily use, from pits to toes and down below. So every smell test gets a... (sighs) Shop for Old Spice Total Body Deodorant. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 153, The Early War at Sea, part three, The Kriegsmarine. This week, a big thank you goes out to Rhett, Mark, Abir, Sam, Eric, and Daniel for choosing to become members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Throughout the first 150 episodes of this show, we've discussed in good detail some of the impacts that the experiences of the First World War had on the nations that would participate in the second. Today, we will start with another one of those impacts, and in this case, it revolves around the German Navy, generally referred to as the Kriegsmarine. The efforts of the Kriegsmarine existed in the shadow of the events of the First World War at sea, and they would reject the strategy pursued by the Imperial German Navy during that conflict. That strategy was one of maintaining a fleet in being, driven by the desire to conserve fleet strength in the belief that simply by existing, they were having an impact on the British war effort. A rejection of this strategy pushed the German naval leaders in the interwar years into a pursuit of a fleet that could allow them to be more proactive with their resources, and this meant that while the enemies were the same, the strategy would be completely different. For most of the interwar period, this strategy was heavily impacted by the provisions of the Versailles Treaty, which prevented the German nation from building even medium-sized military vessels, and also prevented the construction of submarines. While these restrictions would be removed, they would still impact the German naval forces available in the first years of the Second World War because they just didn't have enough time, with the most obvious example being the Panzerschiff, the armored ships which were focused around the task of commerce raiding and which were built in the late 1920s and early 1930s. But even when the restrictions were removed from Germany, it would be many years before the Kriegsmarine could meet other navies in open battle in the classic style, if they ever would be able to. And this meant that for much of the 1930s, regardless of the eventual goals of the Kriegsmarine, the reality was that it had to be focused on a different type of naval warfare. This different type was commerce raiding, and it was seen as a critical task of the German Navy and not just their U-boats, but also surface vessels with the goal of ranging out into the North and South Atlantic and interdicting British trade that was essential to the British war effort. But then, in the late 1930s, the Kriegsmarine finally would have access to the resources required to make its greater ambitions possible, and also it would reject all of the treaty restrictions that had previously dictated its actions. And this would result in a massive planned building campaign that would allow the German fleet to be a serious threat to even the Great Royal Navy. The allure of large capital ships was simply too great, which would result in the construction of first the battleships Gneisenau and Scharnhorst, and then the even larger battleships Bismarck and Tirpitz. These ships were less focused on the commerce raiding goal that the Kriegsmarine had focused on in earlier years, although they would prove to be capable of those kinds of actions. But these ships were only the beginning of German naval expansion, And in the years before the war, they solidified Plan Z, the massive German naval construction program that would begin in 1939. Uh, But of course, anything that begins in 1939 gets derailed by a little event in September of 1939 when the war started. And the building plan, or Plan Z, was only really getting started and none of the capital ships from that plan would end up being completed. 
The interesting conclusion to all of these efforts and, and conversations is that by the middle of the war, and after the attrition of the early war years, the Tirpitz was the largest German warship that was still afloat, and it and other German ships in Norway would end up acting as a fleet in being, just like the German ships of the First World War. They were always threatening the Arctic convoys, and they would require British and American naval resources to guard those convoys, but they weren't necessarily the most active in actually attacking them. Now, I do want to end with a positive note for the Kriegsmarine here, which is that, at least for the surface forces, while their impact on trade was not war-altering, the ability of the Kriegsmarine to distract the Royal Navy and force it to waste ships and resources to guard trade was impressive. It was very impactful. The problem was that this strategy sort of never unlocked a path to German victory at sea during the only window that it would prove possible, which was really just the first two years of the war before the American entry. This episode will focus on the planning, leaders, and buildup of the Kriegsmarine before the war, because once the war started, a lot of the building of especially larger ships was put on hold and then cancelled as resources were diverted to other war efforts, like the uh, construction of U-boats or other military projects. You cannot separate the Kriegsmarine of the Second World War from Eric Raider, who would eventually be given the rank of Grand Admiral. Raider would be placed at the head of the German Navy in 1928, at a time when it was still very small and weak, due to the constraints placed upon it by the Treaty of Versailles. But even before his elevation to this position, he was involved in trying to determine the path forward for the German Navy after the First World War, and he was joined in that work by other German naval thinkers. Even during the Great War, so before 1918, the actions of the Imperial German Navy came under criticism from some naval officers, chief among them being Vice Admiral Wegener. Wegener would write several critical papers of the path being pursued by the German Navy during the war, with that path best being summarized as a very cautious approach that was constantly trying to engineer a favorable massive fleet engagement in the North Sea, while at the same time being very risk-averse, almost always preferring the cautious approach to preserve German ships if the conditions were not incredibly favorable. To counter this, Wegener pushed strongly for a more aggressive approach, which would see the German ships focus on a strategy to push out into the North Sea and attack British trade in a more proactive way. He believed that it was only by more directly threatening British trade that the Royal Navy could be brought out to a battle in a way that was favorable to Germany. These writings were criticisms of Germany's entire naval strategy at the time, and indirectly, they were criticisms of those that had built the navy, like Admiral Tirpitz. And so, in 1916, Wegener was ordered to not write any more critical material for the remainder of the war, and so he stopped publishing writings until after the war. After the war, he then started making up for lost time. First, he would publish a staff memorandum within the Navy that mostly just restated all of his wartime writings, and then he would move on to the writing of Naval Strategy in the World War, which was generally a discussion of the decisions and, in Wegener's mind, mistakes made by the Imperial German Navy during the First World War. Many of the critiques of the Navy and its strategic concept are valid, and I would completely agree that the path pursued by the German Navy in the First World War did not hold a path to victory. And this was a message that many would read in Wegener's book, which had good circulation among naval circles and prompted many discussions. Along with this critique, Wegener would also have his own ideas about the, how the war should have been fought. And it was in these ideas that Wegener would come into conflict with Raider. And to be honest, he would kind of fail to really make a convincing argument for what he was suggesting and why it was possible. Wegener would suggest that Germany just needed to be more aggressive at sea and seek to address its geographic weaknesses as quickly as possible. He would claim that Germany's largest problem in the naval realm was that it was bottled up in the North Sea with limited access even to that sea, let alone the Atlantic, and this could only be addressed by adding territory. Norway seemed like a tempting target, which would provide much greater access to the North Sea and also to the Atlantic and beyond. After geography was solved, then the fleet could move into a more offensive and aggressive stance, threatening British trade with the goal of forcing their fleet into a set-piece climactic battle. These were all great ideas. Fantastic ideas. 
But the problem is that Wegener did not really have a path towards actually making them happen given the naval realities of the 1920s and the 1930s, and even later than that. And the problem was that even though Wegener wanted to change how Germany fought the war at sea, he could not break away from the idea that the end result, the end goal, the way to actually win, was to meet the enemy fleet at sea and destroy it. The problem was that in the final step, the final battle, the final victory, well, it was never going to happen. It was never going to be possible, at least for decades, as long as the Royal Navy started any conflict with such a massive lead in ships. Beckener did have suggestions on how to start chipping away at British strength. Commerce raiding would spread the fleet out. Attritional actions could take place. Those types of ideas. But he could not break himself away from the final battle concept. In some ways, it reminds me of the planning that was taking place in Japan at roughly the same time. Now, the Imperial Japanese Navy would make the Kriegsmarine, even at the heights of its powers, look like a silly little toy, but they had similar planning to Wegener around a naval war with the United States. They knew that they would enter the conflict at a ship disadvantage. They believed the U.S. fleet would charge across the Pacific, and they would be able to enact some attrition on it during that time, and then somehow they would win a magical final massive battle. In the case of the Japanese during the war, and probably how Wegener's strategy would have worked out, the challenge with this type of planning is that it did not properly account for how challenging it would be to weaken the enemy without destroying their own strength in the process. Balanced against these strategies was Raider. Raider did not necessarily disagree with Wegener's conclusions and criticisms of the German actions during the First World War, but he took what was kind of a more realistic approach with how Germany could at least accomplish something with its navy in a future war. He did agree with Wegener that it was important for Germany to have a better strategy for attacking British trade with surface ships, which is one of the reasons that Raider put a high priority on ship endurance at sea during the interwar years. This would result in the Panzerschiff and and many other classes of German ships having greater endurance than their British counterparts. But Raider also believed that some kind of climactic set-piece battle, a Battle of Jutland Round 2, was a recipe for disaster for the new Kriegsmarine. And so instead, he advocated for a strategy that was more around just focusing on spreading out British naval strength and chipping away at its trade. But critically, without the end goal of ever truly actually destroying the Royal Navy, which he saw as an unrealistic goal. This basic concept would be maintained even up to the war years as German naval strength greatly expanded, with the plan always being to focus on using German naval strength not to directly destroy the Royal Navy, but instead to accomplish other more achievable objectives that would hopefully be impactful to the war effort sort of in the aggregate. In these ideas, Raider was not alone among world naval thinkers, because in France at roughly the same time, there were similar ideas circulating. The French were theorizing that if they needed to meet and beat the British at sea, that they really couldn't focus on sort of their strength meeting the Royal Naval strength in in battle, a battle that would always be lost. Instead, the goal would be to find small tactical victories at important moments and to focus on secondary objectives that were achievable because the results of these objectives, and quoting here, may exceed expectations and bring a success having major repercussions upon the principal theater where all remains in doubt, even though the plan of maneuver has foreseen exactly the opposite, end quote. So basically, the French, in this case, and also Raider, were sort of advocating for the idea that if you chip away at enough secondary objectives, they can eventually sort of have an impact on the wider war, even if they are not the primary objective of what you're trying to achieve. Raider would be successful in advocating for his ideas because he was successful in being promoted to the head of the German Navy, which allowed him to reduce Wegener's influence and those that agreed with him. In some ways, the two opposing viewpoints can be summarized as Wegener let his theories of Germany's position mix with mayhem and the dreams of the triumphs of a major naval battle but he did not root his theories in reality. He simply dreamed the impossible dream and hoped that those dreams could be fulfilled. Raider took a more realistic approach, rooted not necessarily completely in reality, 
but at least in some basis of the reality of what Germany's situation was and would be, and how the fleet could be structured to at least have a chance of making some concrete positive moves towards the end goal of winning the war, even if it was not as glorious as sinking the pride of the Royal Navy in an afternoon. Of course, no matter what the strategy was, the Kriegsmarine needed ships, or it couldn't do anything. Before German rearmament started in the mid-1930s, the ships available to the German Navy were not exactly inspiring. There were some old pre-dreadnought battleships that were only truly useful in a shore bombardment role, there were some destroyers and other smaller craft, and then there were three Panzerschiff of the Deutschland class. The Deutschlands were unique ships for their day, powered by diesel engines that gave them good endurance at the price of unreliability. They were also armed with 11-inch guns that were more powerful than anything that was being placed on cruisers of other nations. They also had reasonable speed, which would position them well as commerce raiders. The last of these ships would be laid down in 1932, and so when Hitler came to power and real conversations about rearmament started... Raider and the Kriegsmarine had a choice on how to proceed. More Panzerschiff, or moving German naval construction into larger ships that were closer to the capital ships that other nations were building or possessed at that time, and would also involve a move back to more traditional steam propulsion. This was not allowed by the Versailles Treaty, to be clear. Hitler did not care. The first steps towards actual capital ship construction would be taken in 1935, when the battleships Gneisenau and Scharnhorst were laid down. These ships were undergunned, mounting just 11-inch guns, but with a displacement of 32,000 tons, so they were about three times the size of the Panzerschiff. They would also be joined by the Admiral Hipper class of cruisers, which were relatively traditional cruiser designs of about 16,000 tons and 8-inch guns. As these ships were being laid down, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935 would come into effect, which allowed Germany to legally build up to 35% of the total tonnage of the Royal Navy. This was signed by the British government because they desperately wanted to avoid another naval arms race against Germany when they already had so many other naval problems to deal with. For the Germans, they saw it as a desirable agreement because It made their rearmament, at least in the the naval sense, legal, especially at a time during the mid-1930s when Hitler and others among the German leadership really were trying to avoid a war with Britain. Nobody wanted to avoid a war with Britain more than Raider and the German Navy. The power of the Royal Navy in the North Sea, especially in the mid-1930s, was absolute, and Raider understood the time frame involved in a building program that Germany would have to embark on to challenge that power. As early as 1933, Raider, in discussion with Hitler about long-term plans for the Kriegsmarine, made it clear that it would take maybe as long as 20 years to build a truly modern German fleet. This time frame would be expedited through the introduction of Plan Z. Plan Z was the German plan for a massive naval construction program that would have, theoretically, made the German fleet one of the largest in the world. Some of the highlights were the eventual construction of 10 battleships, six of them being the H-class, which were still on the drawing boards when the war started. These battleships would have been roughly similar in size and armament to the American Iowa class, which would be built late in the Second World War. There also would have been three battlecruisers, four aircraft carriers, 12 new and improved Panzerschiff, and a large number of smaller ships. We don't really have to go into too much detail here because none of them would actually end up being built. There were two major problems with Plan Z, even ignoring everything about ship design or German naval strategy. The first was simply the resources it would have taken to build the ships. By the late 1930s, the German rearmament programs were having problems, um, simply due to lack of raw material. Steel and other metals, for example, were in short supply as the branches of the German military all fought over those materials for their own rearmament priorities. 
And do you know what takes a lot of steel and a lot of other material to build? Battleships with a 50,000 ton displacement. Another major problem was oil. Massive naval ships do not receive great ratings for fuel efficiency, believe it or not, and it was estimated that if Plan Z would have been completed, the Navy would have needed between 8 and 10 million tons of oil per year just to keep it going. And oh, by the way, Germany's entire annual consumption of oil at the time that estimate was made was 6 million, so it would have to more than double to make up for all the ships it had to support. So if the German economy could manage to build the ships, and if the oil could be found to fuel them, there was still the problem of, were the ships that were being built what Germany actually needed? The answer to that question is more challenging to answer than you might think. The lessons of the Second World War would show that the dominance of large, battleship-styled capital ships at sea was over, and air power was more important in modern war. And this angle would be a major area of criticism for Plan Z after the war was over. But as I have so often mentioned, I think it's kind of a a cheap and easy way out. Because if you compare the German plans with the plans of almost every other major naval power in, say, 1939, they all look roughly the same. There was a focus on battleships, battlecruisers, and large cruisers, because that is what naval power was based on in the past, and seemed to be what would also be based on in the future. Aircraft carriers were also an important part of future plans for actions at sea, and Germany was planning on building them as well, just like other navies. One of the problems that Germany faced around carriers was its lack of experience. The British, Japanese, and Americans would all begin building and experimenting with aircraft carriers during the First World War, and and there was a tremendous amount of learning and experience gained from the construction and the usage of aircraft carriers during the 1920s that they could only gain by using those carriers that they'd built in previous years. The Germans had none of this experience, and for most of the interwar period did not even really have great details on the aircraft carriers that other nations were building, but they did at least recognize the power and importance of carriers, and the initial German plans were to build 10,000-ton carriers in 1929. At the time, the plan was for such a carrier to house around 30 aircraft, and be used with the panzer shift and a commerce rating role. This basic usage concept would continue throughout the 1930s, but the plans would get larger over time, with the plans calling for a 20,000-ton carrier in 1935, while the Graf Zeppelin, the carrier that was actually launched in 1938, having a displacement of 33,000 tons. One of the mistakes that the German Navy would make during this time was focusing too much on building what they saw as the perfect carrier instead of just trying to build a carrier of any kind to begin to learn how to actually use them. This learning experience would be the most important impact of the interwar carriers of other nations, as it would have an important impact on their later carrier designs, their later aircraft designs, and all of the systems built around using them as ships at sea and as part of a larger fleet. A great example of this is that the Graf Zeppelin was built and designed around the idea that it would be able to conduct simultaneous launch and recovery operations. Being able to do so would have been amazing, but it was totally impractical for a navy with no carrier experience. Other navies kind of discarded this during the interwar period, or the Americans actually would pursue it a little longer, but it would prove to be essentially impossible during actual combat operations. The German aircraft carrier program was also doomed in some ways from the start, due to the fact that the Kriegsmarine did not control the aircraft that would be on its carriers. Those were instead controlled by the Luftwaffe. This would be a constant challenge for the Kriegsmarine, as it tried to get the resources necessary to expand its naval aviation capabilities during the 1930s. In Britain, they had a similar problem, or the Royal Navy had a similar problem, and it would eventually be solved by the creation of the fleet air arm. And while the Royal Air Force wanted to control all of the aviation assets in Britain, I don't think I would ever characterize the actions of the RAF leaders during the 1920s and 30s as malicious. The Royal Navy and Royal Air Force did have different views about how air power should be used based on their own unique sort of views on air power. And these views were largely irreconcilable. And the creation of the fleet air arm was able to sidestep this problem. And the creation was only possible due to the power of the political sort of apparatus of Britain to dictate changes to the military. 
The situation in Germany could not have been more different. Goering controlled the Luftwaffe, believed that the Luftwaffe should control all aviation assets in Germany, and honestly just did not care what anybody else thought about it. Hitler could have forced change, he was the only person who could have done so, but that would have required him to force changes in the power structures in ways that he never really did with Goering. The disagreements and arguments between Goering and Raider would be a major feature of Raider's memoirs and would be a major challenge for the Kriegsmarine during the war in areas other than aircraft carriers. Even naval patrol aircraft would be something that would have to be constantly negotiated with the Luftwaffe. It would have been even more impactful if Plan Z had reached anywhere close to completion. So I guess in that way, it was good that the war started in 1939, Otherwise, the the situation with naval aviation would have been even worse. By every other metric, though, the fact that the war started in 1939 and that Britain joined with Germany's enemies in 1939 was a complete, total, unmitigated disaster for the Kriegsmarine. Plan Z was not truly underway, and even the pre-Plan Z Bismarck and Tirpitz were not due for delivery until 1941. The U-boat expansion program that was also part of German rearmament planning, which we will discuss in more detail in later episodes, had also not really gotten underway. There were plans in place for the Panzerschiff and some of the German cruisers, but even the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau had only completed their workups in the summer of 1939, and in August 1939 they would be in port for refits and improvements to their seaworthiness. This unreadiness limited the ability of the Kriegsmarine to have a large influence on the war in its opening moves, but it did not prevent them from having an influence. And in that sort of vein, the Kriegsmarine, given its very limited resources, would really maximize its impact in some important ways during the first six months of the war, especially up to the Norwegian campaign in early 1940. For further information on those actions, you'll have to tune in to next episode, in which we will discuss the early actions of the war at sea.